Welcome back to mini lecture number 11 for Computer Science 252 at the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire. In this mini lecture, we'll be looking at how the CPU works, um, how the different levels of memory in a computer work, and how both of those work together to, uh, uh, with certain tricks and optimizations to ultimately give your computer the best performance that it can. Um, and this is one of my favorite mini lectures because it's talking all about optimization. What cool tricks do they use to, to make things go faster? Now, as required reading, um, the following URL at the bottom of the screen here does an excellent job of explaining um, a number of these things. So I want you guys to read it um, as it could be covered in the final exam. Self-check questions. Um, use these as review for the final exam. But otherwise, I'll go on. If you have questions about them, let me know. The central processing unit is at the heart of any computer. From the first time that you boot up your computer, it starts warming up the CPU, which then will grab an instruction from a certain spot in its read-only memory, not just random access memory, RAM, but a certain point in um, hard-coded ROM in order to boot the computer up. Now, when the CPU runs, it kind of acts, there's what we call a pipeline, um, a pipeline of instructions that the CPU is going to, um, uh, to, to do, like a stream. So the cycle is basically as follows. It fetches the next instruction from memory. It decodes the instruction, trying to figure out, okay, well, what does this actually mean? What do I need to do as a result of this instruction? And then executes the instruction and then repeat. So it will basically keep doing this on and on and on and on and on. Now, these different instructions, you notice there's a decode instruction. Why, not, why doesn't the CPU just know what to do? Like, doesn't the CPU know how to add? Well, yeah, it does but sometimes things are a little bit more fancy. And in fact, different machine instructions will take different amounts of time. Before we get to that, let's see what the pipeline actually looks like. <clears throat> the CPU pipeline might be visualized as this. So look at first just the leftmost column. At clock cycle zero, in other words, there's a little timer that's making the clock run at a certain, um, you know, certain frequency. But at clock cycle zero, there's four instructions indicated by these colored boxes that are waiting to go into the pipeline. So they're queued up. The next clock cycle, one, the green box has entered the pipeline, so it's being fetched by the memory uh, for the CPU. The next clock cycle, that, uh, the purple box is now being fetched, while the green box goes onto the next stage where it's being decoded. What, is this, uh, ex what does this step actually mean? Uh, what does this instruction mean? The next uh, clock cycle, three, the green box is now being executed. So that instruction is being executed by the processor um, doing whatever it needs to do. Then it will uh, go into the right back stage where if it needs to, um, to uh, if there's any memory that needs to be written as a result of this instruction, you know, add one to variable A and then store the result in variable A into variable B. So then it will write back into that memory if it needs to. Uh, clock cycle five, the green box has now gone into the completed instructions and we can kind of forget about it for now. But meanwhile, every step of the way, there's this kind of, you know, these uh, instructions in the back of the pipeline and they're, they're all coming along one after the other in different stages. Now this is a very idealized case. In reality, a lot of times there'll be little bubbles um, inside of the CPU um, and not a physical bubble but represented here by a little circle uh, in the thing. So let's say we follow instruction, uh, the, the green instruction. The green instruction goes by without really any problem. The purple instruction, however, um, on clock cycle two, it, you know, it gets into the fetch stage, so the CPU fetches the purple instruction, and <clears throat> uh, it turns out that the green cycle actually takes a little bit longer to, um, to run. So sorry, the, the purple one takes a little bit longer to fetch. So it takes a little while, and so now the green, ex, uh, the green instruction keeps on going, not worrying, you know, not looking behind it, but the purple instruction and all the instructions behind it are all now piled up a little bit. So they're delayed. And so in uh, clock cycle three, there's nothing being decoded for stage two. But then purple, you know, comes to the decode stage and it gets decoded. But meanwhile, now, now there's nothing in, uh, for clock cycle four, there's nothing being executed. So the, the CPU is standing kind of idle, um, you know, not in, uh, executing anything. And then for the next stage, that bubble goes on to stage four, 
and then finally everything meets up afterwards. So there's basically a, a little delay and things get um, piled up and that's going to slow the computer down overall. Now what kinds of things can cause those delays? Let's take a look. Not all CPU operations are created equal. Some of them are going to take a little bit longer than others to do. So for instance, at the very, very top, the very fastest um, operations are bitwise operations. So um, adding integer numbers, um, doing a bitwise or, bitwise and, bitwise not, all those things take like one clock cycle. They're super fast. Um, some of them are even faster. Um, they can be done instantly. So those kinds of operations are lightning fast. So the CPU could do all those all day long. Going down a little bit, we have addition and subtraction. So that takes, you know, for floating point numbers. Um, so if they're in that representation, it can take a little bit more, one to three uh, clock cycles. Multiplication, a little bit more, one to seven clock cycles. And again, this right here, these are just average numbers. It, this will depend totally on the CPU that your computer has. Um, and may vary by 10, 20, even maybe 200%. Now, floating point division, that's quite a bit down there. Uh, that takes somewhere between 10 and 40 uh, clock cycles. So that means that it can be adding, um, or it can be multiplying 10 times for every division. Now, that's something to keep in mind, because if I'm multiplying by, uh, or if I need to divide by 3, maybe it would be faster, act you know, and if I need to do that a bunch of times, maybe it would be faster for me to, you know, uh, keep a value, you know, one third and then multiply by that one third. So I only do, the, do that division one time, and then I do the multiplication, which is fast, to all the other times. Now integer division is actually uh, even just a tiny little bit longer than uh, floating point division. Um, so again, integer division, it only do that if you really, really need to. And modulus is even a little bit longer, if I remember right. So those are the basic operations. Memory access. Now we'll learn a little bit more about what the different kinds of memory are. L1 is fastest, L2 is a little uh, slower, L3 is slower. Um, but basically those are the different cache levels of the CPU that the, the CPU has with exclusive access to. RAM is your general purpose memory. So like my laptop right now has 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, that's still kind of fast, but it's much, much slower than the caches. So if the computer says, hey, I need to read something in memory from L1 cache, it might take only, you know, three to four uh, clock cycles to get that. So it's delaying the pipeline for three to four cycles to get that memory. If, however, it's not in the cache and it needs to be read from RAM because it's maybe a variable that isn't very often used and it's still in RAM, not in the cache, then it might take, you know, 100 times longer or almost 100 times longer for me to fetch that in RAM even though your RAM might be blazingly fast, just because of the way the program is uh, structured um, and the way that your, your code is written, it's going to take a lot longer to, to fetch that from the general access uh, RAM. Now, we've often talked about in this class uh, dynamic memory. You know, if you need to malloc some memory or um, freeze some memory, those kind of operations, if you need to malloc um, a small array, um, you know, if it's a small array, it doesn't really need, the computer doesn't need to go around looking for memory. If you need to dynamically allocate a gigabyte of RAM, maybe it needs to spend some time thinking about that quite a bit. But if it's just looking for like, you know, a, a few kilobytes or a few bytes of RAM, um, that just takes something on the order of um, 200 to 500 clock cycles, which again is a lot of time. Your computer is just sitting around, you know, twiddling its thumbs for 200 to 500 clock cycles when it could have been doing all these amazing other things. That's a long time. So we don't want to be dynamically allocating memory all the time if we can help it. We want to save that for when we really need to do it. Let's talk about branching statements. Um, these are other operations that the computer uh, might have to do. So in an if statement, um, the way that it can be done in assembly is uh, there's the if statement. And if the, uh, if the condition is true, then the, you know, the code just keeps on going, keeps on going, keeps on going. But if it's false, then the assembly language might actually make the computer then branch. In other words, it'll, be, it'll basically have a go-to statement. So if it's true, just continue doing the code just like you were before. But if it's false, then go to this other section of the code. And that requires um, you know, uh, loading new code maybe into the CPU, um, maybe loading new different variables or something. Um, so that can take a little more time the compiler will actually try to predict which of those it will be. 
So if the compiler predicted it correctly, then it takes one or two clock cycles. Nice. But if the compiler didn't predict it correctly, then that might take 10 to 20 clock cycles, so 10 times as long if it has to do that go-to statement for the false condition. And of course, the compiler can flop those because you know, if your condition is if a equals 3, the, the compiler could say, oh, the predicted result is a equals 3. Um, but it could also say, no, let's flip that. If a doesn't equal 3, let's predict that to be the correct answer. So anyway, it can choose. If your program calls a function, uh, that can take somewhere between 20 to 50 um, calls. Um, so, or sorry, 15 to 30, or for an indirect call, 20 to 50 calls. So that can take quite a while um, for the, the computer to run. Now, if it's doing a kernel call for a special kind of, uh, of function, that can be 1,000 to 1,500 clock cycles. So if you do that, you want to avoid doing those unless you really, really need to. Don't just keep doing them willy-nilly. Now, for exception handling, like you've seen in Java, now C++ has exception handling very, very similar to Java. For those kinds of things, it can take 5,000 to 10,000 clock cycles because those things can be quite a bit of extra things. You have to be um, switching different threads, checking this, checking that, checking permissions, um, doing a lot of stuff in between. And so it takes quite a long time to be doing those kinds of things. Now, if you're doing something called context switching, that's if you say, for instance, have to go from one thread to another thread or one process to another uh, process. That's called context switching, and that can take anywhere from 10,000 clock cycles to a million. So you obviously don't want to be, you know, calling another program or creating a new process or a new thread just because it sounds like fun. You only want to do that if you really, really need to do that because it's going to make your CPU sit around idling for a long time. And if you want, there's a really cool diagram at the bottom of these slides where it talks about how far light travels when the operation is permitted. Awesome. Let's talk about processes now. A process is an independent program that is executing on your computer. So that means that the process will have its own memory space, its own device files, like its own standard in, its own standard out. Also, it cannot directly access data in other processes. So its address space is protected from some other meddling you know, um, uh, process or something. That also means that if your process has, you know, a bunch of, um, if, if for instance, you and I were both working on the thing servers at the same time, you wouldn't be able to access my program's memory and I wouldn't be able to access your program's memory because they're separate. And that's for security and for safety because we wouldn't want, you know, if, if my program had a whole bunch of bugs in it um, that pointed to other places in memory, you wouldn't want my buggy program to try to just start glitching out and spazzing and changing your program's memory. That would just cause the computer to shut down really fast. So they're protected. They're isolated from other processes in that way and in other ways. They also have their own code to run. So when you call the exec uh, you know, family of uh, system calls to execute a new process, you're telling it to load a whole new process with its own new memory space address, its own device files, and have that be protected from other processes too. And because of that, that context switching is a really big operation and it takes a long time to do. <clears throat> now you can run, at least in Unix, you can run multiple instances of a program as separate processes. So I could have five different clients be running at the same time because the computer will read my client program, load that into memory as a process, and then it could do that again as another process. It doesn't need that file to be open in order to read it. It reads it once and then it can read it again and it can read it again, no problem. I could even modify the program while that, an instance of that program is running because that program will then be in memory. And so if I change what's on disk, uh, that doesn't matter because the real copy of the program that's running is in memory. Now the CPU can context switch from one process to another. When it does that, it switches the memory, it switches registers in the CPU, um, it switches the stack pointer, program counter, stack heap, and other things that may be uh, needed. And this takes a really, really long time. However, it allows processes to run concurrently with each other. So for instance, if I have a, um, you know, one process, my, uh, you know, one program that I'm running, and I have it going for a long time, you could be running on the same computer, and you could be running another program that's running for a long time, 
and there could be a lot of different processes that are all running at the same time. Now on a single core machine, they're not actually going to be running at the same time, they're going to be taking turns. In fact, these processes will run, they could run out of order, they could run in partial order, mixed order, but ultimately the operating system is going to make sure that these processes will run um, and they'll get the same answer no matter who went in what order. So if your process runs, um, it may have to stop and wait you know, like five times for my process to go. Um, but it's basically the operating system is saying, okay, you take some time. Other process, it's your turn now. Go for a second or two. And then another process, now it's your turn. And it does this many, many times per second to give all the different programs a little bit of a chance to run. This gives us the illusion of these, problem, of these programs working all at the same time, when in reality, at least on a single core machine, they're all just taking turns, doing a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. It's like multitasking in the sense that you're not really truly multitasking and doing different things at the same time, you're just able to switch really, really fast between different things. Now in a multiprocessor, uh, multiprocessing, you actually can have multiple CPUs working on multiple things at the same time, but that's later. What is a thread? We've talked about a process. A process is a really heavy thing with lots of memory that are all isolated from other processes and so on. How is this like a thread or how is this unlike a thread? Well, like a process, threads are independent streams of instructions. So a process is a program, it has its own set of instructions. A thread's gonna have the same thing. So a thread has a, a queue of instructions that it wants to do. Threads belong to a shared process. So one process can control say a dozen threads, or maybe a hundred threads, if you're like Google Chrome or something. And so these threads can all share the memory of that same process, <clears throat> for better or worse. So processes can't share each other's memory, threads can, because if they belong to the same process. So because of this, threads are more lightweight than processes. They don't have to have all their own memory, though they may. And because of that, it's a lot faster to switch between one thread and another thread for a given process. <clears throat> so in the same way that a pro um, the computer can do context switching between processes, it can do context switching between threads for a given process, but it's a lot faster at doing that, um, context switching for threads, than it is context switching for processes. Now, threads are usually um, called on to perform a really simple single task and then destroyed. <clears throat> So for instance, you might make a new thread and tell it, I want you, <coughs> excuse me, I want you to run this function that might last, you know, um, a few hundred clock cycles and then be done. Or maybe you'll have it last for a few seconds and be done. But usually threads are called to perform simple things and then they go away. The processes on the other hand are usually called to be much more long lived. Performance, how does this all work? Performance we can kind of roughly define as how much useful work gets done per unit time. And so this begs two questions, because this is a kind of loose definition. What do we mean by useful work, and how do we measure time? And those two questions kind of pale and are usually laid on the wayside by this bigger question. How do we improve, how do we improve performance? We all know that we want to you know, do more floating point operations per second. Um, but there are different ways of going about this. We could be doing a lot of um, not useful work, and maybe we can reduce some of the not useful work we're doing so that the CPU can focus on the useful work to do, and that will boost performance. We could also perhaps be doing more things at once, and then we could, you know, uh, to improve performance that way too. We'll look at a bunch of different ways to do this. So we can begin to ask the question, how could we go faster? Now, back in the older days, you know, several decades ago, at the dawn of computers, uh, one of the quickest and easiest ways to do this was to make processors faster. A faster processor clock speed would mean that the CPU would be able to handle operations um, faster and then you'd get more work done in less time. Unfortunately, this is lim uh, limited by uh, just a basic physical law that says that the faster your transistors are turning on and off and the uh, higher the clock speed, the more power you're going to, um, to use and the more heat you're going to generate. And I, if I remember right, the um, heat or the energy required is proportional to the clock speed to the fourth power or something like that. 
which means that this is a very dramatic um, curve. It, it starts off really slow, but um, there's going to be a limit eventually to how much um, you, you go. Uh, if you double the amount, if you double the clock speed, you're going to use 16 times more power, something like that. Um, so this is a, a pretty hard and fast limit that you really can't get around, and that's actually what we're experiencing today, um, where we really haven't seen anything go above a couple gigahertz for clock speeds. It's because if you double the, the um, yeah, if you double the uh, the processor speed, you're going to basically be getting you know that processor will take something like 16 times more energy. Um, which is not something that you want. So you can make a bigger thing and have more heat dissipation, but then you run into other problems. So anyway, what some people did back then, um, Cray Supercomputer and IBM, International Business Machines, um, they used liquid cooling. And now we use liquid cooling, air cooling, um, as a way to help cool computers down. And that was really cool, but that was happening, yeah, in the 1960s and 1970s, decades and decades ago. And now we're finally getting that to our own personal computers in our house. If you have a, a gaming rig. I wish. <laughs> I so wish. Uh, if anyone wants to support me and buy me a gaming rig, uh, I would gladly accept it. But anyway, another thing you can do to try to go faster is to have a more compact design. And the idea here is that if you have a smaller chip, you know, your CPU on a smaller um, silicon wafer, then it takes less time for electricity to go from point A to point B on that wafer, and therefore, Less time uh, to tra travel means less time or faster data transfer rates. So if you can make a smaller chip, you can uh, get more data transfer rates faster. But again, if you're on a smaller chip, it's going to be harder to dissipate that heat and uh, it goes back and forth and back and forth. Now, Cray supercomputers dominated the supercomputing industry in the 1970s and 1980s because they came up with a bunch of uh, innovations like these and a number of other ones. Um, and some of their supercomputers were just heads and shoulders above uh, other computers. So much so, in fact, that they basically, uh, or people, you know, saw, hey, your computer is 10 times faster than the leading fastest computer. That's a supercomputer. And the name stuck. So uh, other ways that you can go faster. Um, we're on this trajectory. Let's, let's make it happen. How can we go even faster? The compiler is actually plays a critical role in making your code perform at its best, highest potential. One way it does this is by performing loop unrolling, or knowing when to perform a loop, loop unrolling. And the idea here is, say I have a loop that sets the values of you know, my 20 element array to zero. Rather than you know, doing um, i equals zero, um, you know, and then element i it sets to zero, and then you know i plus plus, and then uh, does i is i less than twenty? Yes. Okay. You know, so if you instead of doing all that logic of a for loop, what the compiler will do is it'll say, oh, you need to go twenty iterations. Okay. So it'll actually copy out the body of that for loop twenty times and change the index of those those commands each time. And so what'll happen is it will um, it'll take away the branching aspect. It'll stop checking whether i is less than twenty because it's keeping track of that all itself. And so by doing this, it can avoid the branching that we saw before would uh, take a lot of time for the CPU to, to, to adjust. So that's one way that the compiler can help uh, optimize your code. It'll look for places where it can do this in loops. It will also do something called loop interchange and reordering. So if you have a loop within a loop within a loop, as we'll see on the next slide, you can make that go a lot faster. Next, you can also use a, uh, a strategy called caching. So if you have a variable that you're using very often, <clears throat> you can try to maybe reorganize computations or, or so on to try to keep those frequently used values um, closer in memory. And if they're closer in memory, closer to the CPU, then it takes less time for them to get to the CPU. And the compiler knows exactly how to do that, and it's, it's amazing at that, way better than I am. Another way is by performing something called branch optimization. So you might recall how I said that um, the, the compiler will have to decide, um, you know, if I say if condition equals true. Now the compiler might think, it might have some reason to believe that 99% of the time that condition is going to be false. And so if by default, if I do the true statement, it'll actually produce faster, it'll, it'll go faster through the true version 
and it'll go slower through the false. And the compiler might say, oh, 99% of the time that condition is going to be false. So it'll change that, that um, the branch logic of the program, whether it's just a simple if statement or more complex like loops or switch statements or so on. It'll optimize that to try to get the fastest performance by trying to guess what the most likely outcomes are going to be to try to minimize the amount of branching that your program will do. It tries to put all of the commands in a row that it needs and it tries to minimize the number of go-to style statements that it needs to make. Here's an example of loop reordering. In a regular for loop, for instance, you might count, uh, you might be assigning uh, six elements of an array, say. Um, and so you're uh, doing this, you can see what's going on. I don't have to explain it to you. The problem here is that there's lots of branching. At the end of each for loop, um, at, or at the beginning, I should say, it has to check that condition. And then at the end of each for loop, it has to increment that, um, that index variable. There's also an index variable, which is maybe unnecessary. So what the compiler will do uh, in loop reordering is it will take away the for loop and just flatten the entire loop out and write it out explicitly like this. Now this is a trivial example, but it can do this for more complicated situations as well. Now let's go to loop reordering. <clears throat> Suppose you've got these um, two if statements and you're trying to initialize the values of uh, an array. Now, practically speaking, these two blocks of code are functionally identical. But in the first one, we're looping over the i index first and then we're looping over the j index. And in the bottom one, the outermost loop is j and the innermost loop is i. Now, this is a question that I expect you to be able to answer even now. Excuse me. Um, for the exam, based on your knowledge of how the array operators work in terms of how pointers work, you know, how is that related to pointers, how, which of these two methods do you think would be faster for the computer? So I'll let you think about it for a little bit. Pause here, because I really expect you guys to be able to do this. Try writing those array operators, um, the bracket, square bracket operators, out in terms of the, um, the dereferencing operator. All right, and I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. So this way will be much, much faster. If you're looping over the um, rightmost index, you want to be doing that as fast and as often as you can because that's that will access all of the array elements in order. The uh, approach on the bottom is going to be jumping around in that array, you know, uh, doing all different ones uh, all over the place. So it's jumping around in memory and it's going to make the computer have to jump around and load different parts of this array and different parts of memory. But if you could do it all in a row, the computer just has to go change this element, 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 rather than change this element, jump around, change this element, jump around, change this element, jump around. And so it'll produce much, much faster code. And in some simulations that I'm doing right now for Saturn's upper atmosphere, doing this kind of thing can actually produce a really significant speed up in code. Um, as much as 10, 20% in the overall simulation speed. Um, exact numbers to be confirmed later, but some initial estimates were, were showing that that would be um, a pretty good way to speed things up. There are other ways that your compiler will try to make your code more optimized for speed as well. The first, is, or another one, is function inlining. So in function inlining, if there's a small function that's pretty simple, the compiler can actually replace the, uh, if you call that function, say, in your main method, the compiler will replace that function call in your main method with the actual code from the method. Um, basically, this is going to, uh, re it's going to remove the function call by basically having it compute the stuff in the function um, in your main method instead. So you reduce the, um, the overhead of having to create a new stack frame in the, st uh, the program stack um, for a function call. Um, and that can speed, and you avoid branching a little bit, so that speeds things up quite a bit. Um, don't underestimate function inlining. But again, it has to be for very simple and short and small functions for the compiler to do this. C++ actually has a keyword that will let you, uh, will hint to the compiler, hey, you should inline this function if you can. Um, as far as I know, C does not. Vectorization, um, so if you have to compute the same thing many, many times, um, many CPUs uh, will allow, will basically vectorize it which means that it will put it into separate registers and kind of compute everything all at the same time. Um, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do vectorization. Um, I won't go into all of them, um, but it depends a lot on the, the CPU that you're working with. Um, but that can be very, very uh, powerful as well, because again, 
um, instead of computing one thing, you're computing a bunch of things. This is an example of um, single instruction multiple data, SIMD, so S-I-M-D. The compiler can also perform inter and will perform interprocedural analysis. Now this is a collection of strategies um, and the goal is basically to avoid memory write and read operations. Um, so it'll look and see, uh, it'll go into your different functions and look to see, hey, do I need to calculate this? Do I need to calculate that? Um, is this thing already calculated in my main method when I call it? Um, do I, it, so it basically goes in and it tries to, you know, optimize not just in, within a single function, but it tries to optimize um, across function calls. Um, this is a very powerful and high level um, optimization technique, and it's also very complicated. Um, so I'm not going to go too much uh, detail uh, into too much detail here. But one of the strategies, again, is function inlining um, that it, it uses for that. That's in the family of interprocedural analysis. And finally, the compiler will look at the architecture that you're compiling for and say, hey, you've got this instruction set or that instruction set, or I know that this processor has this, you know, uh, cache size or whatever, and it will optimize for the machine that you're building for, um, which is pretty cool. If, if this machine op uh, offers extra vectorization abilities, the compiler should know about that and will try to take advantage of those. That means that the resulting binary will be less portable because it uses these special um, uh, chipset instructions, but um, you get some more speed out of it. The um, other advantage, and this is something that you would um, oftentimes uh, pass as a command line argument to the compiler. You could either say, no, I want this to be more portable, you know, to be able to be run on many more chipsets, or I want this to be faster and specialized to this particular um, chip architecture. I want to give you an example of inline functions. So here's an example where in the main method you declare an array of 10 integers, you initialize the data somehow, and then you call this function sum, and then you output the total. So then the sum function, um, it takes a const pointer to a constant array, and just the notation there, const int means that the values in the array are not going to change, and then the um, star const means that the pointer is constant, so the pointer is not going to point to anything else. This is just being const correct, and if you want to know more about that, look up const correctness. This is a much bigger deal in C, or sorry, C++ than in C, but um, you can do it a little bit in uh, C as well. Uh, anyway, so basically you're passing a constant read-only array um, in its length, and you compute the sum. What the compiler will do is the following. The compiler will perform in, uh, inlining, and it will take the sum function and get rid of it, and it will um, replace that function call with the actual body of the function, adapting it as necessary to fit inside wherever it was called. So, gone with the function call to sum, and in with the uh, this uh, you know just basically placing all the code from the inline function into this uh, into the main function. So this is extremely powerful because again, you don't need to create a new um, stack frame for uh, the function call. You don't need to do any as much branching. Um, this is a really awesome way to be able to get um, uh, some maximum speed up in your program. But again, it requires functions to be fairly small. But can we go even faster? To do this, let's look at some of the approaches that involve memory. If we can deliver memory to the, uh, to the CPU, fa CPU faster, then the CPU can spend less time idling. So one uh, method is by increasing the performance of RAM chips, um, having either more bigger stores of RAM, so you don't have to ask the hard drive for data more often, or um, just having faster clock speeds for the RAM to be able to return stuff faster, or having bigger buses to return more data faster. Uh, another way is by increasing the performance of uh, permanent storage, like tape drives. Um, originally, uh, these were uh, yeah, tape drives, uh, these evolved then to hard disk trays like platters, um, like, you know, the, a spindle hard drive, which still today are the, the standard for higher capacity um, hard drive formats um, for consumers. And then solid state drives, which are the higher performance for like a gaming computer. They don't hold as much data as a hard drive uh, tray, magnetic disks, but they're pretty fast. Now, in servers and clouds and some of the, you know, for really massive supercomputer use, a lot of times you'll see people still using tape drives. Now why is that? Well, it turns out that tape drives actually have, they're the biggest capacity. I said that hard drive trays, you know, are the biggest capacity for consumers, but if you're a, a server farm, or if you're Google, Microsoft, Amazon, um, Google and Microsoft for sure are using tapes, and NASA, um, the government, 
uh, any supercomputing complex you have is going to be using tape drives, um, just about at anyone, because they have a massive capacity and they're much cheaper. They also have error rates that are much, much lower. So the really big advantage of tape drives is if you need to put stuff into really long-term storage, like you know to archive data or to back stuff up, you want to put it on a tape because it's going to um, keep longer, it's going to have lower error uh, rates for reading and writing to it, um, it's going to be way cheaper, um, way more compact, um, and it's going to have pretty big capacity. So if you're a server farm or something like that and you need to do that, you're going to be using tape drives even still and probably for decades into the future. Um, uh, but instead of, you know, getting, if you need to fetch data, whereas if you ask a hard drive, uh, you know, for data, it'll take, you know, um, tens of milliseconds maybe for a regular hard drive or, um, you know, a couple dozen milliseconds maybe for a solid state drive or less. Um, here you're going to be looking at 50 to 60 seconds to get that uh, data from a tape drive. So again, it's for long-term storage. But let's go to faster. Faster um, storage, usually um, one of the strategies we use is caching. And this can come in several forms. Um, one is that we have several levels of memory um, in for a hard drive. There's um, SRAM. Uh, so this is a couple different types. There's the L1 cache, which is right next to, or part of basically the CPU. It's incredibly fast, but it's extremely limited. So there's only 32 kilobytes of L1 cache, um, but it can return data back to the uh, to the CPU in like four cycles or less, so about two nanoseconds, which is ridiculously fast. The L2 cache is a little bit further away, but has a little more space. So again, this is very fast, only about like three nanoseconds or so, um, give or take. Those numbers are uh, kind of ballpark. Um, it's 256 kilobytes, so a bit more space than the L1 cache, but it's again um, very fast. The L3 cache is quite a bit bigger, um, but again, it's it's quite a bit slower too, um, and it's partially because it's further away from um, the CPU, partially um, slightly different technology, and so on. Then you have your DRAM. Now this is the RAM chips that you think of um, when you buy a new computer. Like I want eight gigabytes of RAM. I want 32 gigabytes of RAM. Um, that's the DRAM, dynamic random access memory. Uh, the other one is static random access memory, which is you know um, embedded onto your, your CPU and motherboard. But DRAM, uh, that's huge compared to those other little caches. So 16 megabytes. Um, when you ask for uh, you know RAM from like malloc and stuff, it's probably going to be pulling from, from these chips. Um, and it's huge, so it has tons and tons of space, but it takes a lot longer to access that memory because it's not you know built in with the CPU. Um, and it's not designed to be quite as fast. Uh, it's made to be as fast as possible, but it's it's you know there's physical limits here. And then of course the next level of memory is your hard drive, uh, and so this is just an extension of, of all these different um, levels of, of memory. Um, it's further from the CPU. It takes longer, but it's meant to be more permanent storage. Um, and this is just immense compared to the other RAM sizes. Okay, so just for comparison for the different um, hard drives, so. Uh, yeah, if you need to get memory from the hard drive, if you're using an SSD hard drive, um, you're looking at um, several milliseconds to several hundred milliseconds, or sorry, um, several microseconds to several hundred microseconds. And then if you're going for a, a rotational disk, you're, you're looking at milliseconds. Um, so thousands and millions of times longer than it takes to, look, uh, to get data versus your L1 cache. So one of the reasons you want to, um, one of the things you can do uh, for your, your code is to memoize. And memoizing uh, is a funny word, like memorizing. And basically, it's you create lookup tables for uh, values that you use a whole lot. And so I'm going to give you an example in a sec. Here's an example of memoizing so th that I'm familiar with because I do simulations. So 3D simulations and spherical bodies, um, like you know, for those on the sun, which I've done, um, those on the earth, which I haven't done, those in Saturn, which I've done a lot, uh, you often solve what's called the Laplace equation for like atmospheric dynamics, interior dynamics, and so on. Um, this is basically the Laplace operator del squared um, for some function f uh, that's shown here. So there's a lot of trig factors, there's a lot of factors that are involved like powers, there's a lot of factors that involve dividing um, by numbers, which if you remember, they're all pretty expensive, to, to especially division. And so we don't want to have to do this every single time for every single um, point on a 3D grid. So what we would do instead is we memoize those factors we'll actually calculate those at every point um, you know, in the simulation domain, and then we'll save them for those points. When we need those points again, the simulation will just look them up 
um, from this table rather than recomputing all those trig factors and inverse r squared factors and, and so on. So this is a way that we can um, save a lot of time and this is a huge uh, performance impact for a lot of simulations that use this. Let's go faster, even faster, warp speed. So these are some of the more cutting edge things that the compiler will do um, and the CPU uh, as well. So memory dependence prediction and speculation. Can we predict what RAM will be needed next? So the compilers will try to predict what branch of an if statement will be taken, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. But sometimes the CPU can do a little bit of this as well by looking at the pipeline. The CPU will also perform something called speculative evaluation. So it will predict what instructions will be needed next, which is pretty cool. So uh, maybe you're waiting for a RAM operation. The CPU will actually be, um, be trying to say, OK, um, let's, let's try to predict, um, do I need to do the square root next? Do I need to do this other function next? Do I need a function call? It can kind of prepare and, um, and, and evaluate those as needed. There's also out-of-order execution or dynamic scheduling. So if you're waiting for, uh, you know, if the CPU is waiting for a lot of data from the hard drive and it's, you know, taking many, many, many clock cycles and it knows that it will take many clock cycles, what it can do is it can say, well, while I'm waiting for that I.O. operation, I'm just going to go ahead and do some extra code that, you know, I'm going to have to do in a little bit. That doesn't depend on that data. And so the CPU can be really clever and keep, you know, chugging along and doing things while it's waiting for other stuff to happen. This is a fantastic uh, optimization of the, uh, and brilliant uh, feat of electrical engineering um, to be able to do all this. So again, yeah, the processor will execute code that it has available to it um, uh, while it can, while it's waiting for other data or other instruction orders. Pretty cool. Normally, um, the compiler says, here are the instructions you should do, and then the computer just does it. But dynamic scheduling, it'll make use of that waiting time. Another one is you can, uh, when you're compiling, you can actually compile um, with using profiling. So profiling is a way to be able to measure how your code actually performs. You can see how much time your, or how many clock cycles, or whatever, um, are spent in each method of your routine. And so you can say, hey, you know, 85% of my time is spent in, you know, in this function, 10% of my time is spent in this function, 3% is in that function, and, and so on um, for thousands of functions for, um, for many of the programs that I've, I've done this for. Um, but what's really cool is uh, the compiler you know, has to make a lot of guesses which branch of the if statement will be taken. So the compiler can actually plant some of these measurements in when it's you know, profiling. And then you can run your code, get, make a ton of observations and measurements, and then at the very end, your compiler can recompile the program based on the performance and behavior. If it finds if it finds out that you know it predicted the if branching and stuff wrong, it can correct that based on the results of this profiler. So it can actually uh, boost performance quite a bit there too. So can I run multiple things at once to try to, to increase performance? There's a couple of strategies here. One is SIMD or SIMD. This stands for same instruction stream, multiple data stream. So What's happening is you're getting, um, you're trying to operate on doing the same operation on multiple pieces of data at once. For instance, if you have an array of 100 floats and another array of 100 floats, and you're trying to multiply each element of the first array by the element in the second array, you know, a1 times a1, or a1 times b1, a2 times b2, a3 times b3, you know, equals c1, c2, c3, and so on. What you can do is it can send that same multiply instruction to all of those elements of the array at once. Now this is a form of, this is basically vectorization. Um, the, there's nuances there too. MIMD uh, stands for multiple instruction stream, multiple data stream. So that means that you're giving different instructions to different streams of data, rather than giving one instruction to multiple streams of data. So this is more what you would think of when you think of multiprocessing, you know, doing different things to different data streams at once. Context switching. This is another way of, of running multiple things at once. So for context switching, you, you switch from one stream of instructions to another. This could be from one thread to another thread, from one process to another process. And basically, it's going to make things seem like they're running, they are going to be running concurrently. Um, it's not true multitasking because it's not actually, uh, you know, uh, doing multiple things necessarily at once, unless you're doing this on a multi-core computer, but it's still effective. Um, and so this gives the illusion of multitasking. 
Another way of running multiple things at once is to use something called distributed computing, like networking. If you can get a whole bunch of computers talking to each other, like say uh, Folding at Home, Einstein at Home, um, uh, SETI at Home, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence at Home, you know, looking for uh, alien signals and stuff, uh, you can do some pretty cool stuff um, and you can get a lot done. And this is what's done in supercomputers actually. They've got thousands of computers all networked together and you can um, get them talking and working together. That'll be the topic of our next mini lecture. What about other computing devices to help out a CPU? Well, one, sound cards. If we, the CPU doesn't have to be processing sound, it can be doing more useful computations. We can have a dedicated sound card. We could have a dedicated modem or network card so the CPU doesn't have to worry about network stuff. Uh, most computers have this kind of built into the motherboard at this point. Um, you can have a GPU, which still aren't well, usually aren't built into the motherboard, some are, the lower end ones are, but the GPU uh, will take care of a lot of the graphics so that, again, the CPU doesn't have to render that all itself. Um, more in GPUs later. There's also now things called many-core processors or coprocessors, such as the Intel Xeon Phi, um, which is, unfortunately, as of this year, now discontinued. But basically, it's a, um, it's a whole bunch of CPUs almost put together. So it's a many, many core, you know, dozens and dozens of cores um, on one single chip. So if you spawn a whole bunch of threads um, or you do a bunch of, um, of light uh, uh, compu parallel computations, it's, it's really good. And it's better than a GPU for certain things and GPUs are better than the coprocessors for other things. Multi-core processing. Now to do this, let's uh, define some, uh, some words. The core is a processing unit. So when you think of like a CPU, um, you can think of a CPU as a core. Uh, a, a core is basically one um, processing unit that will take one set of instructions and do that on a stream of data. Now, a core, its focus is basically on general purpose computing. Um, it's not trying to do specialized computing like a GPU or, or other things. It's, it's a core, it's a, it's a CPU um, by itself. Now, true multiprocessing uh, when you have that, true multiprocessing means that multiple instructions really are being evaluated at once. This is MIMD, the MIMD, multiple instructions, multiple data. Um, that'll happen when you have multiple cores on a single uh, computer. Hyperthreading is a proprietary name um, trademarked by Intel, um, and it's basically the, the, their name for simultaneous multithreading. Now, simultaneous multithreading is when you have um, one core working on multiple problems at once. Um, so this is an example, a small scale example of um, multiple instruction, multiple data. So you can be having like say two threads working um, on one core. Um, that's what Intel's hyperthreading is, two threads, one core. So if you have four cores, you can actually have eight threads going at the same time, which is pretty awesome. Uh, I don't know how it works, it's magic to me. But simultaneous multithreading, you know, could be two, which is hyperthreading for Intel, or it could be more. Uh, and so yeah, one core, uh, will actually appear to the operating system as two separate processors. So then the operating system can then delegate two different processes to the single core, um, where normally a core would be only able to handle one. Pretty awesome. And again, this uh, is to be able to get more data flowing and getting computed uh, per second than would normally be uh, getting computed. Let's talk a little bit more about GPUs, graphic processing units. They're very specialized. They can spawn millions of simple, short-lived threads per second that can do very really similar, simple things. Um, now, this is in contrast to a CPU. A CPU is designed to be able to do all kinds of things. Um, it, uh, so a GPU has a limited instruction set relative to a CPU. A CPU can do all kinds of instructions. A GPU has a limited uh, instruction set. It also has limited memory. Now, some of the bigger GPUs you know, have like maybe eight gigabytes of, of video memory. Oh yeah, but there's other kinds of memory too, static memory, shared memory, um, caches, and so on. Um, and so it, the way that a GPU uses that memory is very different than the way that a CPU uses the memory. They also have lower clock speeds compared to a CPU. And they also have this concept of threads in a warp. Um, it's kind of, you know, to use the analogy of a loom, um, you have a whole bunch of threads, like for instance in CUDA, you might have 32, uh, so CUDA is a proprietary um, uh, programming library and environment for um, NVIDIA graphics cards. And there you have 32 threads that will work together. So they all have to have the same instruction at the same time. 
And so if one of those threads, you know, thread ID zero uh, has to do one instruction um, and the other, th you know, 31 threads have to do the other instruction, they're gonna have to wait for each other. So maybe the first thread will go first and then all the others will be sitting by idling um, while that first, that first thread does its thing. And then that first thread will wait while the others do their thing. And then they'll rejoin at the end and continue on with whatever they have to do. So they have to work together. Um, and if they're doing the same thing, they get great speed up. And if they're doing different things, then they just have to wait for each other. And different warps can be doing different things. Let's compare a GPU versus a CPU. So these are two top of the line um, uh, products. On the left is a, an NVIDIA Titan RTX GPU, um, not meant for gaming, but meant for um, hard computation, because we're about the computation here. Uh, Intel Core i9 7980XE. Um, this is a high-end CPU just coming out, or just came out uh, a year or two ago. So the NVIDIA has a slower um, base speed, so 1.35 uh, gigahertz Intel Core i9 has you know, roughly three times um, as fast as that. The RAM of the NVIDIA Titan is 24 gigabytes RAM. For the, um, the CPU, well, you choose how much RAM you have. The caches are still gonna be tiny, like you saw on a previous slide, just kill, you know, 32 kilobytes, 56 kilobytes, uh, 32 megabytes, like that kind of size. But then you get to choose your dynamic RAM. The CUDA cores on a Titan is 4608. So you can be having a whole, whole ton of threads. Again, millions of threads being spawned and destroyed every second. Whereas in the Core i9, it has uh, 18 cores and with hyper-threading, 36 uh, threads, 36 different things that it can be doing at the same time. So it's a lot less multi, uh, a lot less parallel than the NVIDIA Titan. But again, the CPU has the ability to be doing all kinds of different instructions and using all different kinds of RAM and so on. The NVIDIA Titan has 16 teraflops of uh, floating, point, floating point operations per second. So that's what TFLOPS means, teraflops. So 16 trillion floating point operations per second. Dang, that's fast. And then the Intel Core 9 is 1.3. So these are theoretical uh, upper limits. You're going to get a lot less in practice. But um, again, the NVIDIA Titan is, has to be having, uh, it can get that peak performance only when it's doing special, very specialized um, operations. Uh, another option is the Intel uh, Xeon Phi coprocessor. Just for comparison, that's about 1.3 megahertz, so comparable to a GPU. Um, it's got 72 cores, and those 72 cores are basically more like a CPU core than a graphics card core. So they can actually do a, you know, the big instruction set that a CPU can. Um, it's still more lightweight in some ways than a real core for a computer, but they basically have all the capabilities of a regular CPU. They can run processes, programs, and so on. Whereas uh, uh, a graphics card, they, don't, they can't run processes, they can only run um, threads, to my knowledge. And that gives you an extra couple of teraflops of, of RAM as well. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with me. It was long, I know. Um, but here are some review questions. Um, these would be good study questions for the exam. Um, but I encourage you to think through these. If you have questions, please let me know early. I'd love to help. Um, but that's the review questions. And finally, a practice problem. Um, I want you to try to think about some of these different optimizations that your compiler can do. Get to know your compiler. Um, GCC is one of the best compilers out there. Um, probably, I would say the best, but um, it depends what you're using it for, of course. But check these out and give one of them a shot. Um, it's not too hard, um, it's, and it will be really cool. I don't encourage you to do this before um, uh, exams, but give it a shot afterwards, and you'll be, you might be surprised by uh, the results. All right, that's it. Thank you for your time and attention, and I will talk to you later. Jess out. Bye.